So I'm so excited to have Benjamin Cox and Ben Murphy joining us in the hot seat today. Uh, they'll be chatting to us today about exploration economics with content from their BRIM program at the University of British Columbia. So it's going to be a fun session. Use the chat. You'll have the chance to jump off me at the end of the presentation. Uh, so yes, I hope you all have a bit of fun. And thank you so much to the both of you for joining. Cool. Yeah, thank Thanks, you. Jess. Appreciate it. Um, lucky Cam's gone now because the funniest thing about the BRIM Institute, which is the Bradshaw Research Initiative for Minerals and Mining at the University of British Columbia, is the head of BRIM is a Tasmanian. And I'm sure he would have given us more stick for that. <laughs> Benjamin? Yeah, and, and it's actually National um, Truth and Reconciliation Day for Canada um, mm -hmm. as we face our native school history, um, both in Canada and in America. So if there's a day to acknowledge the native lands you're on, today is it. Um, I'm in Monoma County, which is part of America, which is part of America. Um, and we've, we have a lot of tribes here, including um, the Chinook have, have been here. There's about seven tribes that met in, with, where we are in the world. And I could read them all off, except I'd be really bad at that with no short-term memory. Um, welcome, to, welcome to us, me and Ben. If you guys have your cameras on, we'll actually be able to see whether or not we've actually landed a punchline. So it'll be a bit easier to teach, but that's, that, that's entirely your choice. And we're going to talk about exploration economics, which is such an oxymoron. Um, when you realize that BHP spent a half a day's, a half a day of their one year earnings this year on expiration, they spent $56 million on expiration total this year. So that tells you how much people care about expiration these days. So this will be a relatively depressing conversation. Um, there is the national suicide hotline in both Australia and America. When you are done with this, if you need to do that, please take it full advantage of that because this is not necessarily going to make you particularly happy. But on the other hand, we do have some solutions in part of the process. So this is this is not a yay, joyous sort of part of the industry. This is much more the depressing part. This is like going to Winnemucca to see showgirls. Um, if you're ever going to Winnemucca, you'll understand what I'm talking or about. Or just going to Waluna, coming back to an Australian yeah, example. same difference. Mm. Um, anyways, so let's move on. Um, ben, you want anything yep. to slide before I flip it? No. I, I'm actually traveling today. I am not in Australia, despite my accent. Um, I'm in Tucson and I have no idea who the native people here are. Uh, regularly, I live in Denver where the native Arapaho people uh, used to um, live on the land. Just as an acknowledgement, let's flip on. So, so safety we, share. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. And you'll see this from us. We jump in over each other and play like this is how we teach, how we talk. Um, so part of the BRIM program, uh, we're really focused on trying to get education out there and looking at a different aspect of the minerals industry. Um, the core value is really using economics and finance as a common language to bridge and break down a lot of the silos. And through the program, we teach various things from studying at geology up to mineral processing and everything in between finance with a heavy emphasis on sustainability. And one of the issues um, we've thought is important to address in the industry is actually selling concepts. So it might be as simple as selling your boss an idea or selling your boss a project so you get some money to do it. Um, and one of the Show things- Show me the Benjamins. Sorry. Ex <laughs> there we go. Um, one of the things that really came clear in our capstone subject is on presentations. And in any presentation in our industry, we are focused on safety. And we always have the safety share at the start. And when Benjamin was doing a lot of research on how to present things, how to sell things, just about everyone who's written anything agrees that most sales pitches, uh, successful sales pitches, are closed in the first few minutes. After that, you, you sort of lose people a bit. Yet in our industry, what do we always have first? The safety share. So really one of the key things to getting your ideas across and having a win is making your safety share about what you're going to try to sell in the rest of the presentation. And, and, to, and to do that, you have to employ something called the hero's journey. The hero's journey is a wonderful thing. You have to start somewhere. You have to go to the, to the apex, to the success, and you have to come back down to the conclusion. And then you have to tie that conclusion back into what you're selling. So I'm gonna tell a story from my childhood. My father was infamous for famous reasons. And one of my early childhood stories was the time we got the brand new helicopter. So my father was doing exploration. He got a brand new helicopter. He was very proud of this helicopter. And one day he just starts to scream. We're in the house and he is just beyond livid. And I'm like, what happened? And he's like, the helicopter got destroyed. 
Apparently that day, this brand new helicopter got rolled by a polar bear. Now, polar bears don't normally take out brand new Bell 206s, but this particular polar bear had an issue with this particular helicopter, a very rational issue. Brand new helicopter, new pilot. The pilot flew up into the Arctic, was having a lot of fun, and decided while the geologists were off looking at rocks, he was going to do a walkabout. Now, the mistake he made was he left his peanut butter and jelly sandwich inside of the helicopter while doing the walkabout. Polar bear came up and said, wow, I've never had a metal wrapped peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Entire crew got stranded and brand new helicopter got destroyed. Lloyd's of London was not amused. This is one of my earlier memories. You can, you can understand I didn't have a normal childhood and I'm still in therapy from a lot of this. But the safety share here is when you think about the decision of what you're going to eat for lunch, remember, polar bears can smell 60 miles. About as far as the average junior prospector can smell money at the PDAC. So be careful. If you're going to go to the Arctic, don't pack a polar bear, don't pack a polar bear lunch sandwich, i.e. peanut butter. And if you go to the PDAC, make sure you look broke because someone will smell your money and move on. Anyways, that's my safety share about expiration dollars. Um, let us move on. Um, clear, clearly, that was a little bit more out there, but I gave you the hero's journey all the way with the emotional connection and everything else. And yes, that is a true story about the helicopter. I've got even more stories than that, but, but welcome to my childhood. Ben, good enough? Yeah. Excellent. Good one. So we'll give a quick summary of ourselves. I'm a medieval historian who found the dark side. I've done everything from work for hedge funds. I am currently writing a PhD in environmental economics at Uni University of British Columbia. And technically I run an educational program for UBC, um, which is what you're going to get one class out of. We just graduated, I think 16 people and we're doing pretty good at teaching people how to look at the business of mining. And that's what we're focused on. Hence, hence the background. Our first 16 micro cert graduates were yesterday. And I think we've put something like 300 and is it still in the 300s? People through different courses. So we're pretty happy about that. And we're pretty pumped up today. So my background, uh, I'm the mineral processor, um, Australian by birth, worked all over the world on mine sites, then turned to the dark side of OEMs and really got to be in my bonnet just about the time I met Benjamin about how our industry uh, expresses value and makes decisions based on value. And that's uh, a lot of that theme is what this program is born out of. Typically, we get interaction throughout the class, but for today's exercise, we'll, we'll take questions and everything at the end because we've got a tighter, tighter schedule to compress to. So let's keep moving on, Benjamin. Yeah. And if you have connections, and sorry, this was a previous um, hashtag. I guess we can do Brim Geohug. I, I left the Vale hashtag in there. We do a lot of LinkedIn stuff. So we live on LinkedIn. Um, we used to hang out with John McIntyre there until he got banned. But it was a lot of fun while he was still around. But yeah, we live on LinkedIn and we do a lot of conversation on LinkedIn. We have an entire subgroup on LinkedIn where we hang out. And there's about 1,500 of us in that community. And it's a pretty active community discussing issues in the industry. So come find us there, friend us. We can't friend all of you because we don't know your names. Um, and if we probably don't want to know you either officially. But if you do friend us, we'll respond and we'll be very much be friendly around that. And I think the community is important. Um, especially is fair, when we're locked down, especially yeah. in crazy times like this. Yes, because community, anyway, community is why we started this. Let's get into content. So let's talk about exploration economics. We are not going to necessarily talk about this from the way that most people will. We're, I have someone who, where I've bridged both the worlds, or all three worlds. I've spent time working at the hedge fund. I've spent time running an exploration company. I've spent time working with majors on operational projects. I've seen this from lots of different perspectives. And exploration and economics is an oxymoron. In the last 15 years, all we've done is destroy wealth in the exploration business. We've not created a lot of wealth. And that's a fundamental problem because we, unless we create wealth, we can't harvest the wealth. We can't harvest the wealth, we can't make it back. And we can talk about why that is, but we're also gonna talk about how we can change. A lot of this is about how you change, how you change your bet, how you become more of a gambler and less of a punter. I think that's a polite way of putting it, Ben, or to get my Australian euphemisms wrong. Um, more or less. Okay. He's sort of nodding his head like this. So I think I got it more or less right. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the goal of this class. We're going to, and should I flip on to the, yeah, we're going to do this in with three basic groups of content. The first off, we're going to talk about how we structure our perspective on things. We're going to talk about why we goalpost, how we have perspectives, and then we're going to go into what makes a viable expiration target, 
what makes an ex viable expiration play, and what you need to build in mind. At the end, we're going to give you a checklist where if you reach out to either of us, we'll happily share it with you. And we're going to show you how we check off and look at projects. This content has been relatively well received by majors, by juniors, by people in between, and we've had numerous geologists come to us and tell us we're flat out wrong, and then six hours later come back and become our biggest fans. But none of this is particularly pleasant content, because unfortunately, this is not an easy part of the business. Um, and that's where we're coming from. Yep. You're, you're nodding your head, Ben. I'm just yeah, waiting for you. I'm keeping moving, because this is the quick geohugs version. Yeah, we're this was the slow, relaxed, so, laid back. Goal posting. Um, my name's Ben. I'm an engineer. I like, I like the answer. When I say I like the answer, I like the right answer, and I like it to four decimal places. Five, so every, really? Uh, no, I can do four. I'm, I'm kind of okay. reformed. Wow. But, but this is what I believe is also slowing our industry down a bit. Have any of you ever heard that? Dealt with an engineer or a scientist, and they're, they're so fixated on not just getting an answer, but getting the right answer and making sure it's right. And from what I've seen in my career, the better the engineer, the longer they'll take to make sure they've got the right answer. And that answer will be perfect. It'll be spotless. It'll be to so many decimal places and it will be right. But then you think about how much time does that take? If you want a quick answer, Benjamin can probably pull a number out that's eh, plus or minus 30% straight away. Um, a lot of people can do that. It's, it's a good skill. But yet in our industry, we often focus on making sure we have that right answer. And it takes such a long time to get. Time that could be maybe spent doing something better. Once I started working with the finance nerd um, who's co-presenting with me, I found out what they do in the finance industry. They, they, they goalpost. When they build a model, they get a number. They pick a number. Run the number. Is the number right? Mm, yeah, it's right. Okay. It's a good number. The model works, it's profitable, it's going to make money. Let's spend a bit more time and effort then, refining that number a little bit, not too much time, and then run it through the model again. Does it pass again? Great, let's go to the next level. Let's spend some more time. Do you see where I'm going? It's a very different mindset to what myself as an engineer and scientist was taught, up, taught to do back at university, which is get that right number. So actually going through this process, Starting with goalposts, and this is especially relevant to exploration, and we'll, we'll talk about this as we go on. Start goalposting. Start thinking broadly about what you're trying to achieve and what, what the model looks like, what it needs, what it needs to be to be profitable. And the really nice thing about this is if you put in a ballpark number and, and, and there's just no way it's ever going to be profitable, you can see that straight away. So you can, kill, you can fail fast. You can kill it quickly. Um, and this leads to probably better decision-making, maybe quicker decision-making. And the quicker you, you identify a dud and get rid of it and move on to the next project, the sooner you're going to get to something that's successful. And that's and, why we teach goalposting. And, and, one of the thing, and one of the things that I want to be very clear on goalposting is this. There's this wonderful modern concept called ghosting. People build relationships with other people and they ghost them, they disappear. And someone came to me and said, it's all this emotional energy when someone ghosts you, both in business, personal life, or whatever. And my response is the most lovely thing in the world. If someone just disappears, you don't worry about it because it doesn't cost you anything when they ghost you. You have the energy to find something new. What kills you in this business, what kills you in everything is when the thing just drags. It never quite works. It never quite does. And it never quite works. It never quite doesn't. Goal posting the way we do it means that you know when to walk away. And knowing when to walk away saves you so much energy. Because the reality is we only have eight hours in the day to work, maybe 10 if you're lucky. And we only have so many days of our life to work. And when we're done, we're done. So you might as well have fun during the process. And the easiest way to have fun is get rid of things that are going to drain you. And that's what goal posting will help you with. Can I flip on a bit? Yeah. Okay. Rolling. So before we get super excited about the exploration business, let's talk about perspective taking. Hi, I'm Benjamin, I'm a finance person and I'm quantifiably nuts. You can put numbers to it. I'm fifth percentile on auditory processing. I'm fifth percentile on short-term memory. There's all of these numbers you can use to find me. 
I am not known for my emotions or Benjamin version 1.0 was not known for his emotions until he discovered Brene Brown and the Dalai Lama and a whole bunch of other people. And I reformed myself from being a horrible quantifiable autistic jerk to being a quantifiable autistic jerk with a little bit of emotional veneer. Every decision you make in business comes down to three different ways that people think. You've got the guy who's quantifiable. He wants to see a number. He doesn't trust any facts because emotions lie. You want the person who's qualifiable. That's the person in the elevator who wants to hear the story in the elevator. And if you can't explain it from the 20th floor before the elevator lands at the lobby, you fail that sale. And then you've got the emotional dude. Now, hi, I'm Benjamin. I work with engineers. How many engineers do I know that are fundamentally emotional? Most of them. This is the interesting thing. The person you think that's quantifiable is not, and the person you think that's emotional is not. People never show their true colors. How can you tell an emotional engineer? He's the person with the red truck. And you ask him, why did you buy the red truck? And he's going to give you this 30-minute explanation about it was the perfect truck for him. You say, so how did you pick that particular one? He's like, oh, I went to the lot. I'm like, and you saw the red truck. He's like, well, yeah, but it was the perfect truck for me. And he's going to explain it. But the reality is he fell in love with that truck the first time he showed up the lot and there was the big red truck. By the way, I drive a purple Honda Ridgeline. So my, my truck isn't red, it's purple. Ben has the true red truck. He's got the Lariat something. It's not something. quite red, yeah. But King anyway. Rad something, big, massive machine. Um, but yes, so the emotional is what you have to avoid or not avoid. Now, when you're thinking about this, you have to make sure that every time you make a pitch, every time you sell, every time you have an idea, you have to write it out in the three different languages. Quantifiable is always a ratio. It's dollars per share. It's percent recovery. It's grade. If you ask what grade, grade is not measured. I've got X tons of copper. It's X, it's X kilograms of copper per ton, percent of copper per ton. It is grams of copper per ton. It's measured in that perspective. Quantifiable should always be a ratio. Qualifiable should always be a thesis. It should be words that you can explain to a secretary, your grandmother, and the CEO. If your thesis is not explainable in the Queen's English, it's not a good thesis. Everyone in the world has to be on standard. If it requires an acronym that they don't get, then odds are you don't understand it yourself. Emotional is where you're pulling the heartstrings. And it's not your heartstrings you're pulling, it's the person you're selling's heartstrings. Now, here's the danger of emotional selling. Emotional selling. You think you're selling, I'm going to sell Jessica right now. Jessica, thank you so much for putting me on this program. How do I get back on? I'm not selling Jessica at that point. I'm selling the person who's controlling behind Jessica, behind Jessica, behind Jessica, who's making the decision if Jessica wants to do this again. I can't sell Jessica because I don't know who I need to sell to truly make something happen. It could be any so John McIntyre. John McIntyre could be the person pulling the strings. The emotional sale that you're making is rarely something you directly control. So you have to think about emotional selling as pulling the heartstrings of every possible stakeholder at the table. Pretend you're playing a game of poker and pretend you're putting everyone at the table and make sure you emotionally meet the needs of every possible stakeholder. Now, we're talking about sales before we start anything else because this is the important bit of the background and we'll get an explanation in a second. But with, when you go through our content, look at it with these three perspectives as we ask you questions. Shall we move on, Ben? Yeah. Yep. Excellent. So full disclosure, we are not teaching you something according to the Ontario Securities Commission, the Alberta Securities Commission, or any Australian Securities Commission, or the London Securities Commission. No, it's not the London Securities Commission. Um, but we're not teaching you according to Securities Commission. We're talking about we the economic- We are not dual compliant. Yes, in any way, shape, or form in this presentation. So don't expect this to be dual compliant, because if it is, I could write you a dual compliant presentation, it'd be done by now. We're talking about the underlying business. So when we use the word ore or mineral or mineralization or mind or all these things, we're going to blend words because we're talking about economic terms versus fundamental geological or where we are in the jerk perspective terms. So we're going to blend words together, but it's very important to keep in mind that the only reason we find ore is to mine it. And the only reason we want to mine ore is to make money. Anything beyond that's a science experiment. And we're not talking about science, we're talking about the business. Yep. Ben? Keep rolling. Cool. So let's start with the big problem. How many mines are there at a major mining show? How many projects are going to actually turn into a mine in a major mining show? 
Now I'm going to give you the Sam Bolter answer. Sam used to work for me and he would go to major mining shows and he'd sidle up to the CEOs and say, so seriously, off the record, how many ounces of gold do you really have? And he was a, he was a great little guy, but he was slightly, slightly swarthy, slightly this, slightly that. And he really could work his magic. And at one show, he found more gold from the CEOs that has been mined since the history of the beginning of humanity. It was either in Vancouver or Toronto. Everyone on the down low would tell him about the millions upon millions of ounces that was possible in their property. And he found this absolutely hilarious. He loved this game. And they all bought it. That was the interesting thing about the process. They all thought, oh, yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's going to listen really nicely. Lots of people. And, they, and by the way, his point was not that people didn't believe this, him. His point was that all these people truly believed that they had this much ore. There was a genuine belief in where they were coming from. It wasn't a lack of belief. But in reality, if you walk the PDAC or a major mining show, how many possible, uh, 1,300 boosts to the PDAC, largest yeah. mining show in North America, how many mines do you think there are? Yeah. Now, other other get, than established things going into production um, or, or mines that are already built, how many do you think there are? 1,300, was that your number to start with? 1,300 to start with. 1300 people spruiking their minds and it's similar at diggers it's similar there's other i know there's other conferences in most major cities of australia with the same concept and benjamin and i've walked through these and we've played with them we've used our checklist our mental checklist we've looked at what they have we looked at what they're going to mine we looked at where they are as we'll talk about later and maybe we find five on a good good p day i think the best year we found 13 and we were pushing yeah but that was a really good year it was a really good year. Okay. Think, now think about that. Th th just yeah, 13 out of 1300. Now let's take the two examples. We have the geologist. The geologist loves the rock. They love the exploration. They love the story. They love the hunt. They love all of that. It's an emotional decision to go out and look for things because they genuinely believe and love the science they're doing. But they really love the science, but they're doing science in a public company. They're doing science in a BHP Rio Tantoro Jr. Then you got the G CEO. Why does the CEO want to be CEO? Because he wants to be the big boss. Okay? It's really, really, really funny what the CEO looks like. Because the CEO fundamentally loves the ego of being CEO. There's nothing quite like being the CEO of a company where there's no employees to worry about. It's great fun to be the CEO of a company with three people total. Because you know you're the big boss and you're also nobody. The way I described it once, I described this to BHP and I did a big deal with them. So I felt like I just climbed a really big anthill looked around and realized there was nothing left to climb. And I wasn't really sure I ever wanted to climb another one. Mm. Um, they were not particularly amused by that response. So the actual hit rate for, is not 2% anymore. It's actually substantially lower than that. The actual hit rate is below 0.02%, um, which is a terrifyingly yeah. thought. And what? ironically, CRA was the first company I worked for. A week after I joined, it changed to Rio Tinto. So <laughs> that was 20-something yeah. years ago. So yeah. And yeah, I mean, we can look at that. We can look at the ratios. It's gotten even worse. You know, yep. that was a long time ago and things have changed. So fundamentally, yep. we've got two groups of people who are not communicating, who are doing two very different things. And heaven forbid you get a CEO geologist because that's the worst of all combinations. Uh, but we don't need to go there. Should we flip on Ben or do you need to yeah, add keep, more stuff? OK, so what's changed? We all know what's changed. But let's talk about what used to be. And before we talk about what used to be, let's talk about what's happened since 2005. In base metals, let's just limit to base metals because it's easy and people can write the comment in. How many major discoveries have we made? How many world-class major discoveries have we made since 2005 in base metals? Give me a number. Have a, have a punt. Have a punt. We're going we're gonna to look at the questions because this is the only, there's no way to teach without 15. 15 in copper, really? Eight? Eight. We got, World a, class we, got an eight, we got a four, we got a four, we got a five, four or five. five. I, John's number sort of makes sense. It's close. Mm -hmm. World class meaning plus 200,000 tons a year of possible copper production. That scale, two or 300,000 tons a year. A real mine. Not quite oi toigoi, but better than 2B2. I think we've made three. Mm. Maybe three. One in Australia, one and in the Congo, two, which you're going to debate. Two in the Congo, two in the Congo. Two in the Congo. Ooh. Yeah, he really found two of them, to be fair. Two from Ivanhoe, one from Rio Tinto in copper. That's it. We need 
to replace existing reserves, just or degradation to keep, can maintain current production, we need to find an oil toge a year. We haven't found an oil toge since 2005. Okay, just keep that in mind. BHP alone spent in the order of magnitude of billions looking for copper for a zero. Some years they were $400 million a year. They found nothing. So we're not finding it. Now, historically, the massive winds carried it. Boise's Bay's carried it. Olympic Dam carried it. The big projects made the money. They were the ones that made things work. And we've lost them. We don't have them. And we don't have them for a very simple reason. Historically, people like John, who are brilliant, could walk around, sniff the ground, and see a surface exposure. What percent of the earth has not been walked anymore? More importantly, what percent of the earth has not been explored by Google Earth? The reality is everyone can do low level exploration on Google Earth and most of those anomalies have been tested by someone. So now we're doing blind exploration. And we're doing blind exploration with a very long lead time because it's 25 years in, outside Australia, Australia's quicker, but it's 25 years on average around the world from initial discovery to building a mine. And oil and gas is 18 months from initial discovery to production. So people who make a discovery make one in their career, maybe two. But they don't build up any institutional knowledge because they can't operate quickly enough. It just takes too long for the cycle. So they don't build skills. They don't build muscle memory. And we have not built it around geophysics. We've not learned how to make these things work necessarily. And that's a fundamentally very large problem. Add anything, Ben? So we need the metal. We yep. need mining. Yep. Especially if we're going down the path of electrification that the yep. planet... I think we probably need, I think we can all agree on that, um, to improve, to improve the, the, the condition of our planet. Yet, where are we getting the metal from? We've got existing big mines, but they're depleting too, rapidly, a lot of them. The grade is dropping. It's getting harder and harder to get the metal out economically. And sure, you could argue that the economics will shift. If there is a shortage, the economics will shift. That's, that's a given. But if the metal's not there, what, what do we do? And where's it going to come from? So how do we make this business better? Because without a pipeline of new mines, we don't have a mining industry. And, we don't, and the pipeline's broken. So we're talking about how to fix the pipeline. The point of this class is how do you fix the pipeline? Yeah. But you first have to admit that you have the problem. I was sitting in someone's homeowner association meeting yesterday about a failed condo conversion project in America that's sitting on an incredibly valuable piece of land. And they're all like, oh, we're gonna to sell to this developer who's gonna rebuild rental apartments. I'm like, no, they're not, they're gonna bulldoze the place. They're, they're telling you they're gonna buy this place to rehab all these apartments and the rental partner, partners. There's gonna be a wrecking ball here the day after you guys sell. So why don't you wait five years and get proper price? And they're like, oh, well, we don't have to rebuild for 30 years. I'm like, no, keep the building staying for five years and sell for real money. But think about what you're doing. Most people are just reacting. And that's the big difference. So let's talk about what you need. Let's talk about the key parts you need to have an economic ore body. You need size. That was the last slide. You need enough tonnage to make things work. You need metallurgy that isn't going to make Ben Murphy upset at you. Ben Murphy does not like super complicated metallurgy. He uh, can uh, process. Uh, 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 ben Murphy likes complicated metallurgy, but that's the science metallurgist in Ben Murphy that likes playing with bubbles. But Fine. if I'm if Ben Murphy's going to invest in an ore body. He's looking for no arsenic, no weird inclusions, a decent liberation size, and a whole host of other things. And as soon as I see those red flags, I run scared. Yeah. And Ben Murphy is probably the most liberal metallurgist I know. He will try anything, um, including Australian beer. Then you've got location. Can you imagine mining there? Can you mine, imagine even exploring there? I remember when this London hedge fund showed up in Oregon to look at nickel laterites in Southern Oregon. Yeah. Not only in Southern Oregon, which is the most liberal state in America. Sorry, sorry can, most... I, can I kind of translate? Yeah. I, I grew up in northern New South Wales, so Byron Bay, Nimbin. I, I grew up in Lismore. Um, think Nimbin, Oregon, and you'll be fine. Please so continue, Benjamin. Just imagine Portland is the most liberal city in the world. Okay, if I actually admitted what I did for a living, I would be stoned in downtown Portland and they'd burn me an effigy just because it'd be fun. So these bloody London hedge fund people showed up and they bought this massive project in Southern Oregon that was creating 2% nickel laterites and it was lovely. And they went to get a drill permit. Now, not only was this in Southern Oregon, it, drilled, it drained into California. It was in the California water system. 
So they got the Friends of Sacramento River Valley. They got Greenpeace. They got everyone else all up in arms and ready to go before they even got their first drill permit to do six meter mud holes. They were doing a series of six meter mud holes. So they show up my office and say, you're from here, help us fix this. I just started to laugh. I'm like, really? What are you going to fix? Like, write off your money and leave. They're like, but, but this is like the world's greatest nickel deposit. We've got 10 years of the global nickel demand supply right here. I'm like, you sure you do, but it's never going to be mined. Because they didn't have a license to operate. They didn't have a location that was mineable. They had great title. But great title without these other two things doesn't matter. Now, the reality is a whole bunch of other things you need to add in there. And these are multiplying effects. If you lack any one of these things, you don't have a mine. Pebble is not going to be a mine because you don't have a location that's mineable. You might be able to get a government license to operate, but you can't get a social license to operate. There's a lot of deposits out there that don't have metallurgy, but they've got wonderful size. They got decent grade, but they don't have metallurgy. Now, each of these things need to be taken into account. And the key is to keep in mind that as an industry, because we follow JORC, because we follow 43-101, because what we've done with BREEX and other things, we only look at size to start off with. We refuse to review anything else early because heaven forbid we do that and go outside the regulatory environment we live in. I'm going to make the business case that you can review everything else early. You just can't write a business case around it. It's one thing to review something. It's nothing to make a public statement that you believe, have belief around it. Hmm. But if you're bunting your of, own- back of, back of the envelope calculations. Are lovely. And then you can build posts. Hmm. What do we need here? What's the size we need here? Anyways, let's talk about how we're going to do that. Should we move on, Ben? Yeah. Yeah. Once again, so, the focus is if it's going to be a dog, let's kill it early and move on and spend our resources on something that has potential to make the money and become the mine. Cool. Benjamin. So much like all Jews, because after all, I'm named Benjamin. And I'm, I was raised a religious Jew and now look at me. I've fallen off the path. There's four questions that one must ask. Passover is when you normally start the four questions. We're going to ask four questions about the business. So let's put these things together. There's tonnage. How many possible tons could there be? And you can do this as early as a sniff test. We have an area. There's two faults. We're drilling between the faults. This is the possible size. This is the area. This is we're on. We're, we're roughly looking at this. Other deposits have been found with 100 kilometers of here have been roughly this size. You can build a rough footprint very quickly. Two, location. Google Earth is your friend. If there's a single famous movie star within 50 kilometers with a lakefront summer home that is living near where you are, Figure out what their political analogy is because they're going to be very public on Twitter and other things about their stuff. If they turn out to be anti-mining, you might have an issue. If there's a world-class famous geologist who used to be the head of exploration for a major mining company who happens to love canoeing, and he happens to feel that the canoeing areas near your project is his favorite backyard ever, move on. Because he might be very publicly anti-mining in the case of his backyard. Plus, so he, knows you- all, plus he knows mining. Yes. So, so he's not arguing with some person who likes hugging trees and just doesn't like the concept of mining. This person's been at the core of the mining industry. If the person, the hypothetical person, hypothetical, has been at the core of, course. of the mining industry for a 50 year career. And he now has decided he wants to protect something. And yeah. there's a $500 million public company on the other side who is battling against the wind, against these incredibly well organized environmental groups. So figure out what your location has. Does it have logistics? Does it have opposition? Does it have things that work? Can you imagine putting a mine there? Can you even imagine putting a tailings dam there? Where are you going to put your tails? We're going to talk about this more in depth. Grade. Every region has got a regional grade that the ore bodies come in a range on. Make a guess. Early on, make a guess. We don't care if you're right or wrong, make a guess. And finally, Is there regional metallurgical issues that are going to make this not a mine in the future? Is there a reason why if every other mine in the region has high arsenic to the point where it can't be taken out of the concentrates, why your thing is going to be different? Can you explain why you're going to have regional metallurgy that's going to work? These four scoping questions are going to limit where you drill. But is that a bad thing? Because you're going to very quickly make the decision that if I drill, I'm looking for things that matter. Because you really only have very few initial drill holes. Coming back to the emotional, qualitative, and quantitative, you have very few initial holes. And if you hit them wrong, do you get a drill a second time? How often do you get to go back? How many gambles do you get to take? Yeah. 
does it matter where that first hole is? Like, Absolutely. Obviously it matters, but yeah. So on geometry, there's some great geometry and depth absolutely so i absolutely believe in i absolutely believe that with tonnage you look at depth and you look look, 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 look at the metallurgy um so grassberg was grassberg had a surface expression a very nice one yeah well that's the whole story how grassberg was found but yeah. the location point comes into play probably one of the most inhospitable remote places in the world 60 miles but from the coast it, 60 miles 3, from the 000. coast today mm. versus central Alaska. I mean, let's be really clear. The Bornai project in central Alaska is 700 miles from a road that's still 700 miles from the coast. You know, there's a level of inhospitable, I mean, lovely ore bodies. I mean, I love those projects. And I think some, please don't use the microwave. I'm um, sorry, we have a microwave that's right next to my office. And if they turn that on, I may be disconnected. And then you'll be stuck with Ben, which will be really horrible. Um, and I forgot to turn off the Wi-Fi, so unfortunately I'm stuck in, in, in microwave happiness zone. But yeah, I think you would. I think you would because I think you'd have the grade. You don't need all these things to be equal. You can drop one up and drop one up, but you can make these things work. Cool. Shall we move on? So how do you size the bet? Let's talk about punting. We're going to punt now. You've done the scoping things. Now we're going to talk about location in two different ways. Location from an exploration perspective. There's always the question. The question is, what will tell us that we have something to, that's worth going forward on or something we don't? That's not, what's it going to cost us to find an ore body? That's what's it going to cost us to find the decision to continue? What is the size of the bet? Is it 1,000 meters? Is it 10,000 meters? 100,000 meters? How much belief do you have in where you're putting those first few holes? My second three questions is, what's it cost you per meter? And then I ask the silliest three questions of the world. Are you using helicopters or trucks? Are you going to have trees or tundra, i.e. trees or desert or something, or what the, what's the surface expression going to be? And will your people sleep in a hotel at night? By asking those three questions, I can very quickly get a sense of what the cost of the bet's going to be on lots of different ways. And well, you can get forward to come back. It's pretty easy to come back if you have a sniff and there's a hotel because worst case you book another two weeks of the hotel and you throw out another drill program. It's pretty hard to come back if you're dealing with helicopters, tundra, and you got to set up a camp and you got to leave after six weeks and you don't get to come back for 12 months. I've done that. It's horrible. Hmm. Second thing, who are your neighbors? Do you have mines as neighbors? Love we already it. talked a lot about this. Yeah. Wildlife. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we want? talked about the wildlife. I worked on a project in Africa that got put on hold for years because of a red frog. Um, Ribbit. These things happen. We talked about being next to Angelina Jolie's summer cottage. Probably not the best place to try and explore because, yeah, it's going to get in the press. National parks, rivers. Does it drain into a river? Watersheds are important things. You're going to get some natural opposition out of this. You're not going to build a mine in the best fishing spot on the planet. That is actually a case in Idaho, in America. There's the, one of the best fishing spots in the Salmon River is a wonderful little project. It also happens to be the middle of the Salmon River. Now, this river is named the Salmon River for a reason, because people go there to mm. fish, and they love this particular hole. Not very imaginative, though, is it? No, but it was my, my, my oldest brother died on the Salmon River, so it was, my family had the ranch there. So it's an area I know well. You're not get, permitting a new mine on the Salmon River is going to be really hard. They're doing it. They're trying. But if they can't permit a mine in Arizona that's bloody well clean, dry stack, and everything's perfect, what are the odds you're going to divert a national scenic river? Mm. Let's just be really clear on our priorities here. Mm. And finally, what does title look like? What does your social license operate? How long does it take an exploration permit? Who owns the title? And more importantly, what is also on the title? Do you have Franco Nevada or some streaming company in there with a 7% gross overriding plus your firstborn child royalty that can never be removed? I don't Come assume on. you don't have that. Streamers, what? streamers are nice. Don't be like that. Streamers are lovely. I've always wanted to be one. I figured yeah. somewhere, somewhere between <laughs> living in Winnemucca and being the devil. I mean, it, it, it's a great business if you're on the streaming side. If you're on the expiration side, it's, it's a not. really, really expensive money. Hmm. We're very focused on the stakeholders we're representing. By the way, I've been the evil hedge fund guy, so I have no problem with people who get good deals. I just don't like to be on the other side of them. So... What are we going to do next? We're talking about once you've made the decision to do the expiration, these are questions you can hear to ask before you sink a first drill hole. 
And I want three things answered. I want to know what logistics looks like from a mining perspective. If you find something, how far are you from a port location? What's the road going to look like? If you go to the local bar and buy everyone around a drink and say, by the way, I'm running a drill program. Does anyone want to be a helper? Are people going to take your drinks or are you going to throw them in your face? What are the locals going to react to you being there? How are you going to do with power? Just, and I have no problem with paying 24 cents a kilowatt, but you're not going to make a low-grade copper porphyry work off-grid. Mm. So keep in mind, what does your power look like? And then finally, what is it going to look like the consumables and spare parts in? If you're an hour from Tucson, Arizona, I guarantee you that Ben Murphy and his FLS hat can get you spare parts for your pump in less than six hours. Why? Because he warehouses them in Tucson. But if you're in the Arctic, or if you're in someplace in Mexico, just across the border, in the in Highlands, it's going to take him three days to get across the border. So how is your timeline going to last for those things? Now, let's talk about the second perspective, which is geolocation. This is a slightly different thing. What does the shape of this thing look like? Can you imagine it? Is it going to be underground or open pit? Can you imagine where the tailings are going to go? Is there going to be a dam? Which, by the way, in 10 years, you're not going to be able to permit. Can you even build a dam? Yeah. Yeah, because within 10 years, we don't expect there'll be a single place left on the planet where you can permit a tailings dam. Keep that in mind. It's a big shift that we're facing. Can you imagine where the mill's going to go? And finally, can you imagine a mine actually being there? Can you picture where it's all going to fit together and what it's going to look like? Then, when you're done with that, what does it take to actually get the mining permits? the taxes, the workers, and the capital. Now, capital alone, every country has got a cost of capital that is different. There's this wonderful guy called Damodrin from NYU who publishes every three months a cost of capital for every country in the world. And you can figure out the relative cost from a Wall Street perspective of accessing money for Zimbabwe versus Zambia. Look at that, because that matters on your underlying perspective. People change their perspectives when they realize where they are. And that's an important thing to figure out. Now, every last question up to this point, you can answer with Google Earth, Google, and someone like John McIntyre to, to bad ideas against. Every last question here costs you $0. Okay, we've not yet asked you a question you need to spend a fortune on. This is a checklist versus solution. But if you answer these questions so far, we're going to go on with some more of them. You will come back with a much better idea of how to write those three theses we're talking about, the qualitative, the quantitative, and the emotional thesis. You're going to come back with a better business plan. And that means the odds of you spending your money effectively are going to go way, way up. Should we flip on, Ben? Yep. I just put the link up to Demodron's, I think it's his main page, but you can find the risk data for countries very easily there. Yeah, and it's, and it's lovely really, data. It's really yeah. handy when you're looking at projects and building up a project and trying to figure out if you're going to get funding and just to compare countries. <laughs> Where do you want to build a project? Where do you want to start exploration? Um, how many people think of that? Not always. Now, this side is triggering. I apologize for all of you who are emotionally unsustainable. 20 years is the banking Benjamin speaking. It could be if you're gold in Australia, you can get by with the five-year life of mine or something else. But we're talking about real projects. And real projects need about a 20-year life of mine. You have grade to recover mine. You have enough recoverable grade to make money. You need to be a location that you can permit, own, operate, and finance. And then on top of that, you need to actually know what your real timelines are. Now, if you put all these things together into a solid thesis, your ability to raise money, your ability to run the economics of the project gets way way better. And we culturally way underestimate the business planning process of this. And that's what we're trying to come at. We're talking, we're talking about the business of mining. That's what Brim teaches. We're trying to go through from exploration to milling, to operations, to logistics, to TCRCs, whatever. We're trying to talk about it from a business perspective. How do you make a business case? Not a geological case. I'm not, I don't care what the geology is. I want to know about the business side. You still have to pass all of the geos perspective. You still have to pass the geology perspective, the Friedland, the John McIntyre, the this, the that, that perspective. We're looking at the business side. How do you get past those people? Now, before you get super excited, we've got this wonderful thing called a checklist, which we will email you if you reach out to us or LinkedIn out to us. It's simple. It's easy. And we call this the project checklist. Now, Not we put this up. No, we're kind of boring. But. The advantage of this is this is a really good place to start. 
Now, every time we've put this online, we've had at least two geos come to us and say, well, it either needs to be three pages longer or one third the size. We've yet to see anyone who's happy with this single page. But our view when we wrote this was, hey, if you could check all of these questions off like grade, size, byproduct, shape of ore body and the resource, you can check off location, exploration access, mining transport, what's freight gonna cost you, port, country risk, license operate. If you can check off your financials, is it can, a low grade copper porphyry in Chile? What do you think a low a 0.4% copper porphyry in northern Chile is costing today to build? What's the price tag? It's five bills. Five billion dollars is basically the entry into northern Chile for a low grade copper porphyry. Now, think about immediately when you say that, you're like, okay, wow, sit down. Then you have to realize that you're pumping the water up the hill. You got $1.4 billion in a water system alone. Mm. Mm. You know, there's real money in these things. And then you have to realize, okay, who's going to be the JV partner? It's going to be a Japanese firm. Every Japanese JV agreement is public online. All the active acid deals, agreements, you can download and read. Half the tech Kaminko deals with, with, with the Japanese, you can read in non-redacted form. There's a bunch of those that are in public format. Read them, they're fascinating. They give you a format of what the JV structure is gonna look like if you're in that region doing that. Then management. Now keep in mind, I've got two perspectives on management. I've got financial management and I've got management of the project. Now let's come down to management of the project. How many geologists think they can build a mine? I've yet to meet one who doesn't. That's not true, but I'm now starting to meet them. But a lot of the juniors in Canada are convinced they can do everything. Are they expressionists? Great. But do they want to build a mine too? Uh. Or are they not expressionists? They don't know what they're doing. So they're neither, which is really dangerous. Are they, are they what I call the potato, um, the, the potato chip management? They're really good. They taste good. But by the time you put them in your mouth, there's just a bit of salt left. How are they smart or are they stupid? You don't want too smart. You don't want too stupid. You want someone who's just capable of getting stuff done. And finally, can they raise money and are they connected? Don't ever underestimate the value of the local mob, whether that be in Canada or that be in the US or that be anywhere. Can they call up the head of exploration at XYZ company and get them to do something? What's the value of their Rolodex? Okay. Development. What do they need? What's their current status? What steps are left? How much money are they burning? How much time do they have once they get their permits? What don't they need? So John, there's more than two dozen people who can build a mine. There's a lot more than that now. I used to believe that. I don't believe that anymore. And here's why. Some people are not antisocial like me and you and can actually work with other people. So you can get three or four competent people together and they can build a mine. The number of individuals, like, like, like I love Friedland, but do you think Friedland builds his own mines? No, he goes out and he can get this guy and that guy and he fires some of them. And like Trump, he might piss off the other ones, but they tend to get it done as a collective. Hmm. So I believe there are collectives that can do this. There are good collectives that can do this. Antif gas is full of them. There's companies that are full of them. Mine type, permitting, I can keep on going, infrastructure, finance options, and finally and notes. And the idea, it doesn't have to be an exclusive list. It's a guideline. And that's yeah. why I put this together because we walk around shows, we look at projects to invest in or to sell stuff to or this, that, and the other. And by going through this, you can soon pick out the questions that aren't answered. And that's what I've found a lot when we, when we look at people spruiking their deposits being the next most amazing thing in the world. There's always a couple of things they leave out. And by using a list quickly, you can answer 90% of the questions. So, you know, they're okay. And then you can focus your time. Once again, it, it's all about spending your time wisely. Um, really digging into that thing that may, you thought might have been missing because it's usually the one that's going to gotcha. Have you and, gotcha. And, and, and I'm not saying gotchas are a problem. I'm saying that I had a wonderful South African CFO who had two famous sayings. He said, if you ever sit down at a poker table and you don't know who the idiot is at the table, you're the idiot, get up and leave. Any poker table you sit down at that you don't know who they're, everyone's playing against, odds are it's you. That's the first one he said. The second thing he said is a donkey that doesn't know he's a donkey is a jackass. So if you know you got a problem, that's fine. I have no problem with problems that you know you have because then you can solve them. Mm. But how many guys have you met that say, oh yeah, my, my relationships are just fine. And the next day they're divorced. 
or, oh, yeah, my car is running great. And they forget to change the oil. I mean, the, if you checklist it and you're somewhat rational, you can solve these problems. We have a culture where we're, where we're all bravado. Well, we're going to work through this. This is not going to be a problem. Well, maybe, but it doesn't hurt to actually try to solve some of it in advance. That's where we're coming from. And our entire program, whether it be exploration or metallurgy, we, 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 we have the same basic approach of checklists and understanding things. And, so, and simplifying things to break down yeah. a lot of the silos. Yeah. So anyways, we teach an educational program. Um, we just graduated 16 people from seven courses. So we're actually getting a lot of really positive feedback. You don't have to pay us a lot of money. If you join Women in Mining, for example, we offer a lot of scholarships. We believe very firmly in gender equality and other things in the business. Um, but we really believe that education is the key to solving these problems. We have to break the silos. We have to get to people so they can communicate the three different ways. We have to get people who are emotional to deal with numbers and people who are qualitative to deal with quantitative and get the three different communities of thought processes of ideas to come together and more importantly, to break down the industry silos. And we have everything from Paul, who is an NGO expert who wants to destroy tailings dams, to people from Anglo who, who take our program. It's quite fascinating getting all these different perspectives together to discuss the business because that's what we're focused on. We're focused on the business of mining. Now, we're not going to um, sell ourselves any more than that, but we will open ourselves up to questions and I'll go through them and see if there's some other questions that people want to do. And we're, we're here for a while if you want us. You might not want us. We're kind of boring, but you might. Thank you so much.